Hey, we're going to get started. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the first. This is the first uh, snow speaker series that we're doing. It's funded by the John Ben Snow Memorial Trust Grant, and today's topic is social media for social impact. I know we have some young people in the room. We also have a lot of people online streaming this presentation. When I think of social media. I remember 1993 was the year that I received a memo from our HR department where I worked uh, telling me how to access the World Wide Web. <laughs> and it, in case you were wondering, the first social media site was created in 1996. It's called Six Degrees. And so it's been 20 years of social media, and it's really impacted our life. But aside from when I joined Facebook, my sister told me it was the biggest time waster in the world. Um, I think social media has really developed to be uh, a key voice for the nonprofit sector. So I'm really excited about our speaker today. Um, if you haven't met him or seen his TEDx talk, uh, Mark Horvath has been featured by the LA Times, CNN, CBS, MSNBC, a number of other uh, media outlets as a key advocate for the homeless and other uh, social causes. So um, I want to welcome Mark today. He has been voted um, one of the key nonprofit uh, uh, Twitter followers uh, to follow. Um, he's been featured in a number of articles the last couple of years about the, uh, the website work and the documentary work that he's done. He's got a terrific story. So without further ado, please welcome Mark Horvath. Thank you. Thank you. So I got a, we're changing the mic here. Hey everybody, this is exciting. There's a bunch of you, room full, the first one. So I'm gonna go pretty quick. They asked for uh, a couple of things. They asked me to talk about me, which there's a good case study behind that. I hate talking about me, but I end up being this great case study, and you'll see why in a minute. And then I'll, I'll share some best practices, and then time allowing, I'll go into some future, but I want to go quick because I want to get to a point where I can answer your questions. And to me, that's the most valuable part, and I, I'm here to stay as long as they have coffee, and they said that they will continue getting coffee. So, you know, four o'clock, it's the end of the day, you know, tell your boss you're leaving early and stay and let's have a discussion. So, you know, this social media thing, um, I thought it was dumb. In fact, I thought that, said that I would never use social media. And every photo of me, and this is the LA Times, is me looking at my phone. And I can show you a lot of these. These are just, I happen to have a few. So, I also said I'd never be homeless. And I'm very lucky that when I was on the streets of Los Angeles, there wasn't a camera in everybody's pocket. So this is the closest to my homelessness is about six months after I got off the streets. Um, but there's another part of the story. Prior to homelessness, I had a great job in the television industry. In fact, I was one of the people directly responsible for getting Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, Married with Children, 21 Jump Street, the old one that nobody remembers, not this new stuff, you know what I mean? And a bunch of television syndication shows. Now, I never met Vanna White. I mean, believe it or not, it's a little different than TMZ. People actually work in Los Angeles. You know, so it was the manufacturing end of television. A lot of work, a lot of stress. I ended up homeless as drugs and alcohol. I rebuilt my life back to a three bedroom house and a pool in the backyard and a new car and this thing called the economy tanked in 08. And I lost everything again except my sobriety. So this one part I really have to emphasize because if you don't get anything else from my talk today, it's you can do it because I had a bag of socks, a little camera from Best Buy, and Twitter. That's all I had. Bag of socks, camera, laptop, Twitter. And I started a website with 45 bucks. I hacked out the, um, uh, the picture. That's about as much as I know about it, coding. 
and um, started uploading videos. And I gotta tell you, I wanna say it was my marketing genius, and I, I do have some background in marketing, but it was really, I was bored. I was just going crazy. I was around 19 months unemployed, and I needed to give myself reason to get up in the morning. I need to, to, for a purpose. So I started traveling. I started traveling around the country, and in fact, in 09 and 10 and 2011, uh, the Canadian government had me go to 24 cities in Canada. So I, I left Los Angeles and drove all around and everything else. Believe it or not, I hate driving. And I said I'd never drive long distance again. You know, you never, you can never say never. But I started to get these little signs that I was up to something. So this is America's next top model. And back then, you know, this is what the internet looked like. But in, in 2008, a girl wrote, she says, um, I was taught to call homeless people bums, to ignore them, to be afraid of them. Because of invisible people, I've learned they're like everyone else and they need help not to be ignored. So I started getting these little nuggets that it was, it was changing people's perceptions. So this is Los Angeles Fire Department. Now, these guys aren't just getting cats out of the trees. If you wanna look at a social media case study, Brian, who runs, uh, he's our communications person, does an amazing job. Their Flickr group, the photos, just amazing. Mark, you humble, humble us to the point our, our eyes leak. You're among the greatest examples that any of us can follow. Now, this is many years ago. And again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm trying to show influence. Here I am with a bag of socks. House just went into foreclosure. I literally am unemployed without income, and here's Los Angeles Fire Department keep saying, keep going, you're doing a great job. And this was about three weeks ago. I happened to land in LA and they said, welcome home, Harley Normal, with a hearty thanks for all you do, you're why we love LA. So I mean, Los Angeles Fire Department, and we'll go into listening in a little bit. So on the left, that's Nancy Pelosi, and on the right, that's me. Now, homelessness isn't sexy unless it's Thanksgiving. And, you know, at the time, Nancy Pelosi is Speaker of the House. This is Bentonville. This is the home of Walmart, which some would say controls the world economy some way until it all went to Seattle and Amazon. And here, me, being Photoshopped, all I got is a bag of socks, Twitter, a loud mouth, which you guys can validate right now, and I'm being photoshopped with the Speaker of the House on the front. You know, gosh, that stuff never happens. This is Ford Motor Company. And my iPhone literally sank to the Ford Motor Company website for two years. So if I took a photo or my videos, they went to the Ford Motor Company website. And again, bag of socks. Nothing, really. I'm unemployed. And... Um, Nobody's done that. I mean, United Way, Salvation Army, Red Cross. I mean, you know, getting your nonprofit on a major car company like this. So I've done a couple of uh, uh, different campaigns with Ford and um, did some stuff with General Motors, Murphy Oil, uh, Haynes. When I first started working with Haynes, I'll be honest, they started giving me socks just so I'd shut up. Now, together, we have worked with the Salvation Army and given about four million pairs of socks away in the last few years. So we did a campaign, not this year, not the year before, um, but this campaign was actually really amazing. It reached 132 million people in the month of December. And at the time, they said it did more than what they were doing on NFL Sunday. And what was interesting about that is it wasn't about me and my nonprofit, and it wasn't about socks. They actually were featuring stories of homeless people, and that's what made it went, go viral. Also, um, I, I used Hanes and uh, Vine at the time, which I don't think Vine is as popular as it was back then. So there's a bit of popular culture and timing with your storytelling because if there's something coming up, but this is the actual real truth of the homeless numbers instead of what the government is. So I use major brands in cause campaigns to be a megaphone to share the truth about homelessness in a way and reaching people that I normally wouldn't be able to do it. So Kenneth Cole, the clothing company has used my videos. Tyson Food has used my videos. 
August 22nd in 2010, I think it was the 22nd, I know it was a, a Sunday, it was either the 22nd or, or, or close to it, uh, YouTube gave me their homepage for a day. Um, that's like CBS giving you the evening, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago. It's not even possible anymore. YouTube has completely changed, redesigned their homepage. But 1.6 million people in a 24 hour period who would have never rolled down their window to talk to a homeless person had a positive experience with homelessness. And I continued to do a lot of stuff with uh, YouTube. Gary Vaynerchuk, some of you may or may not know, we did a big campaign, raised $50,000 at South by Southwest, big conference. And uh, Google contacted me and asked me to record, uh, interview some videos for President Obama. A uh, few years ago, after the State of the Union, YouTube and Google did a YouTube interview and they really wanted our president to hear from people experiencing poverty. I was truly honored. Again, what was really cool about this is it wasn't brought to you by invisible people or Google. It was just the poverty stories, which is truly amazing. Remember how I said I'd never tweet, never do social media? That's me speaking at Twitter. I'm the first cause to ever be invited, nonprofit to be invited to speak at Twitter. But this is the stuff I like. So I'm in Baton Rouge and there's a tugboat operator says, brother Mark, we got 50 homeless kids that don't have any shoes, and within an hour we raised them shoes. This is Don. Don is the first person actually housed by my work. There's been quite a few people since. Uh, a farmer donated 40 acres of land that's now feeding 150 people a week. Uh, to make it even better, these are kids from a homeless youth uh, organization that go and work on the farm during the summer. Uh, this video is really dark. That's because it's really late. It's Calgary, Canada, and it's extremely cold. Donnie was homeless for 21 years, and I'll be honest, at the time I was living in Los Angeles, I didn't develop my Syracuse blood yet, you know, and I was ready to cry, ready to ask the outreach workers, please, this is too cold. Take me back to the car, and we went down one more alley, and there was Donnie. And in the Calgary community saw this video and they rallied and they got Donnie into housing. So when I did the Canadian road trip, of course, I stopped by and hung out with Donnie a little bit. This is Terry Pettigrew. Terry Pettigrew was um, homeless at eight years old. Here he is uh, 54 years old. He's dying of stage four cancer. Uh, at the time, and again, you know, through most of this, I'm in some state of poverty myself. And I'm like, poor me, I'm like going, I don't have anything to eat and here's a, a guy dying of cancer in a homeless shelter, right? And he was so positive and he was so encouraging, you know, like that, that grandfather type, you know what I mean? You can do it, you know, and he's encouraging me. So sometimes it takes me a while to get the videos up. I don't, I'm not able to do it right away. Um, but this one, I went right back to the hotel and put it up and he was reunited with his brother that he hadn't seen for 33 years. In fact, he was able to spend a couple of months at home before he passed with family. So that's all great, and there's tons of more. That's just some highlights. Um, it's all really cool stuff, but how do you make it happen? How do you do it? How does that translate into actionable steps that you can, for your own personal storytelling, your own personal brand, or your organization, or your advocacy, or your church, or whatever. So let's start with your voice. Okay, now often it's really hard when, see for me, I know my organization voice because I have one employee, <laughs> me. So I am at all the meetings, I know everything that's going on, but so for you, what is your voice? Anybody, think, tell me your, your nonprofit, and what, if you're a car, what kind of car would you be? Um, 
Now, that's interesting. Why a school bus and why barely gets out of the garage? Any, somebody else? A couple people? What car would you be? Uh, I'm from the Salvation Army, and I think that we would be an ambulance. Yeah. Because uh, we're a safety net. We go out and rescue. Okay. So. Good. So what celebrity would you be? <laughs> and there's exercises like this. I mean, we don't have the time to really dive into this, but one of the things in storytelling, especially when you're storytelling for an organization, you get self-conscious. Oh my gosh, what if the CEO sees this? What if, you know, what is this, you know, going to be like when other people see it? It's easier to share your own personal stuff on Facebook. The other thing is you have to have a unified voice that, let's say, if you have a lot of staff members, maybe you're sharing, like we did at the rescue mission, there's several people that have access to that Twitter account. So w would you be George Clooney, kind of cool, you know, activist? Would you be, you know, Kanye? I won't go into any description there. <laughs> uh, you know, Lady Gaga? You know, I, I think the world of Lady Gaga. Um, also very much into philanthropy. Anybody? I mean, it could be any sports star, any celebrity, any, what would your organization, what, what's the voice? Have you ever thought about anything like this to develop voices for your organization? Because it is important. So, you know, key messaging, mission statements. I mean, how many of you can even repeat your mission statement? How many of you have a mission statement that you actually say in public? Most mission statements are these big, long things. You know what I mean? That work great on grants and academic type writing. But when you're standing in line with somebody at McDonald's or, you know, wherever you'd be standing in line, you don't say that. So Guy Kawasaki does a big thing about mantras instead of mission statements. So for me, it's changing the story of homelessness. Invisible people is changing the story of homelessness. Really simple. So that type of messaging, what your voice is, what the messaging is, also as an organization, are very, very, very important. So another thing that I, I hope you can remember, and this is actually a principle of Alcoholics Anonymous, is attraction rather than promotion. So often nonprofits on social media are saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, give us money, look at me, look at me, give us money. Come volunteer, look at me, give us money. Hey, there's a bake sale. Look at me, look at me, give us money. Give me. How do you build community? So then you say, oh my God, see, I get a little passionate here. You guys got to bring me back if I go out on. So, you know, you can fundraise on social media. A lot of people say, well, I'm not getting the impact because you're not building community. If you're just going, look at me, give us money, look at me, give us money, look at me, give us money, people aren't going to engage with you. So you have to be attraction rather than promotion. One of the best examples are, this is the best hot sauce, everybody agree? <laughs> do you know they absolutely do no marketing? They don't have a Facebook page, they don't have a Twitter, they don't even have a web page. because of word of mouth and a great product. If you are in the community and you are doing a really good job, people are gonna talk about you. 
And that has to be the core of your storytelling. Now, I wouldn't go drastically of no web page and no marketing, but I'm just trying to use it as an example, is you got to create a value exchange with people, a value exchange with your donors, with your supporters, with your volunteers. You have to create some kind of worth between you to build that community. So how many of you have had a family member or a coworker, if they're here, don't point them out, um, that only talks about themselves? <laughs> right? So you look at your average nonprofit Twitter stream or Facebook, they're only talking about themselves. And what do you do? See ya. I'm not going to listen. Oh, they're just talking about themselves. So a way to, do, to build that community is find maybe current events, maybe some other content, maybe share a competitor even that you might think in the same sector. Because let's face it, you know, just one nonprofit is not enough to cure everything in the world. And there's this interesting thing I'll go in later on the law of reciprocity. But you got to look at your Twitter stream. And if you're just talking about you, if your social media is just talking about you, you're not going to build the community for that asset to be a benefit. You have to work backwards. So what is it that you want? What is the end result? So like, for instance, recently, Instagram did Instagram stories. And I bet you a bunch of people jumped in and said, we got to be there. We got to do Instagram stories. We got to do Snapchat. There's billions of people. Why? Why? You don't have to be everywhere. Here's a little nugget. You create the least amount of content that will produce the most results. And the results have to be from, you know, in line of whatever your, your strategy. Social media without a strategy is a trick, not a tool. And so what is that success to you? Now, how many of you saw Puppy Monkey Baby? <laughs> Some people didn't, so I added the video. I usually only add play the video when I speak internationally. So I apologize. I actually like this spot, but... So, Puppy Monkey Baby got a lot of buzz, got a lot of attention. Did you go buy Mountain Dew? Have you tried it? Anybody? I have yet to find anybody that has tried it. So one of the things that either clients or bosses or even coworkers is, we need more awareness. They didn't know about us. Oh my gosh. Well, awareness does not equal love. Just because somebody is aware of you doesn't mean that they're going to support you. It doesn't mean that they're going to engage with you. And often, people will tell you that they know. So you meet somebody, and they tell you where you work. And it's easier to say, oh, I've never heard of you than, gosh, I've never donated to you. So you can't just go by that. But the big point is, a lot of times, just People want this volume of impressions. They want this, oh, we got to have billboards. We got to have radio. We got to have all this other stuff. We got we to make people aware because when they hear all this great stuff we're doing, maybe they're supporting the Salvation Army. Maybe they're supporting another good cause. Charity Water is one that I support. I love the Red Cross. There's a lot of great causes that you support. You're never going to get 100% market share. So what my point is with your strategy, when you figure out what the success is, then you build your audience to where a target audience is. You don't just go, oh, I want to make everybody aware. You want to make the people that are going to support you aware. So um, this is Natasha. And Natasha was, this video was literally recorded on this phone. 
And I didn't plan on um, storytelling this evening. I had just landed in uh, London. My head was pounding from um, jet lag. And, well, let me just play the video. Natasha, you're homeless in London. I am. It's raining out there. It is. Where is this food? On the street. I have like 24 pounds. And what's 24 pounds going to get you? Yes, the hostels tonight. The, it, 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 the hostels cost? Hostels cost. Yeah, unless you get a hostel in the council. Oh, so then the council pays for it? Yeah. Um, my gosh, and you've got crutches? And now, how long have you been homeless? I've been homeless for four years. Four years out here? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't there any help? I've tried everything, charities, everything, but I'm not a drug addict, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not pregnant. I've worked at them three times a week and helped all of them. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. So this type of video should not work, right? Because, you know, typically in the nonprofit space, a video is about $1,000 a minute, you know, that you would pay and have this nice produced video. Overnight, this received 164,000 views. But again, the, that, that isn't what I was after. It started this great conversation about welfare reform in the UK. And that was the whole point of the, wealth, uh, the awareness campaign that I, I do. But authenticity has replaced production value. So if you can and you have the budget, there is still a place for produced content that's very well produced. But now we have the tools and everything's going to video. So in five years, YouTube will be 100% mobile and mostly all video. So jump on the video bad wagon and don't let roadblocks like equipment and different things. If you get the best you can afford at this particular time, whether it be camera gear or whatever, or computer and editing, because as soon as you buy it tomorrow, something else comes out and makes it obsolete. And so my video storytelling is raw and edited, and that happened by accident just because when I lost my house, I lost my video editing computer. So I, I almost didn't do Invisible People. I was like, nobody's gonna watch this stuff, I can't edit it. I'm a television producer, it has to have music and B-roll and graphics. How can it, nobody's, oh my God, just raw like that? And that was the magic. That was the magic, the rod. The other nugget in here, besides the authenticity piece, is in nonprofits, we are so sold on just telling trophies and success stories, and we have to. And that validates the work. But if you also share of people still experiencing whatever crisis that they're going through, it builds empathy that you must do that work. But it's all broken. Marketing is broken, and there's new stuff coming in to break it even worse, and that's because of us, us, us 
marketers. We messed up radio, we messed up TV, and we're messing up social media. So pretty soon, ad blockers are going to be so popular. So most of the stuff that we're doing online, digital storytelling, is not gonna be seen. Here's just some stats. Some of these are about a month old. Some of these I grabbed last night. 94% of online viewers skip pre-roll ads before five seconds have gone by. I mean, I don't know if you guys use a consultant, a fundraising or marketing consultant, but they might be telling you, oh, you gotta do YouTube pre-roll ads. Most people skip them. The click-through rate is only 0.06. Ad blocking grew by 41% globally in the last year. At least 419 million people, 22% of the world's 1.9 smartphone users are blocking ads on the mobile web. 12% of display ads are never even seen by human translating into 18.5 billion in ad spend waste in 2015. Those are ads that we're buying that nobody's seeing, but somebody says, oh, look at these impressions. You're doing great. You need to be on digital. Look at all the people. Um, about 50% of clicks on mobile ad are accidental. I, that happens to me a lot. I'm reading something and I'm like, no, good <laughs> yeah. You know, I hate it, but you know, then you know, the people that are selling the ads or the agencies that are selling you the ads, and I'm pro-agency, don't get me wrong, you just have to really monitor what's going on because they're in the business of selling you this stuff. 54% um, of users don't click on banner ads because they don't trust them. 33% of users find display ads completely intolerable, yet we go and buy them and expect other people to support our nonprofit because of some display ad that we're, we hate. And ah. so the other thing that is very important is if you're putting all your assets online, if you're putting all your assets on social media and they make a change, you're powerless. So Google is about ready to punish sites that use the annoying pop-up ads. I don't know if you do, but a lot of people use sign up for our newsletter, which is not, that's a perfectly fine use of a pop-up ad, but it's soon, you're gonna not be able to use them. So now you gotta go change your website. YouTube just made a change to the way they monetize. These are only recent, I mean every week you'll see Changes in social media. Don't panic over Facebook algorithms change. This one was on the newsfeed. And this one was just yesterday or today is that uh, Twitter is finally gonna go to the longer tweets coming on the 19th. This messes me up because I have over 500 blog posts already programmed for a shorter tweet. Now I gotta go and either do it myself or hire somebody to go in and do all this stuff to change it all around. And my point is, do not build your sandcastle in somebody else's sandbox. If you have all your eggs into Facebook, they're gonna get crushed. If you have all your eggs into Twitter, they're gonna get crushed. I'm not saying don't be on Twitter and don't use it, just be aware that they could make a change tomorrow and all this investment that you've done in marketing and storytelling could be totally gone. And the best way is to create a home base. Your asset is your content marketing strategy of your own website, your own email. Believe it or not, right now, email, it's the only medium, broadcast medium that you can control. Email, print, and in-person events are having a huge comeback. Email, in-person events. And one thing, so I was chief marketing officer at the rescue mission for the last couple of years in Thrifty Shopper. And one thing that we would do is we started transitioning where we use social media to get people to an in-person event. Because I can share out a tweet, hey, come, you know, we're doing this great stuff, support us. And it's like, you know, whatever. But the, the conversion rate is really low. But if I can get you to an in-person event where you're gonna tour the campus, or watch a video with our CEO, 
you're going to convert at a higher rate to either being a volunteer or a donor. So you look at it as a funnel, look at social media, and then bring it in to where you can convert them and just instead of look me, look at me, look at me. But the, the strategy, and I highly agree, and the good point on this, so you post a video on YouTube. A lot of people just share the link. Well, YouTube gets enough traffic. They don't need your help. What you do is you embed it on your web page and then send a link of your web page because that's where you collect new names, new names, new names, new names. That's where you get emails, that's where you get donations. You don't want to send people to YouTube, you want to send them to your site to watch. And that is the outpost strategy and thanks Chris Brogan. Uh, he is the original person that came up with this and posted about it. So here's all your social media whatever you may be on, whatever you decide, and that's your asset, you control that. So if Facebook makes a change, you still have your stuff. If Twitter makes a change, you still have your stuff. But the outpost strategy where you use social media to engage with people, but also bring them in to your home base is one of the, to me it's the nonprofit strategy. Become a media company. Gary Vaynerchuk is great at this. Union Rescue Mission, they increased their online fundraising by 500% by doing these stories from Skid Row on video. And so, so often we'll produce a piece of content and that's it. But think about it in episodic. Think about it in story. People want more. Bring them down a path. So stories from Skid Row is a monthly video that's highlighted on iTunes and their website. Gary V, ask Gary V, he just rocks these videos out. But it's a continuous, just like you would, you know, Seinfeld or MASH or all the stories, long form. Um, everybody will tell you that YouTube, they, people drop off, and they do. But those aren't the people that are going to support you. So here's Motor Trend, um, and this is from when they got their first billionth view. And they wrote, I think one of the biggest one, uh, they're asking what mistakes. I think one of the biggest one was not giving YouTube crowd credit for being mature enough to consume real, meaty, and authentic content. In the early days of online video, there was the false belief that videos would only be successful if they're short and simple. Time proved that to be a misconception. I think we really started to hit a stride on YouTube when we b began to produce longer form videos. Mobile. I will never produce a desktop experience ever again in my life. If I have a client or a boss that wants that, that might change, but I will never, it will be mobile. Everything's going to mobile. Uh, I highly recommend watching 60 Minutes or any type of story. These are the expert storytellers. When I first started producing TV, all of a sudden I was executive producer of a, of a network show and I, um, didn't really know a thing and the CEO grabbed me and he said, watch 60 minutes, take notes, and then watch infomercials because they're, they're the best at getting you to respond to something. Call now, call in the next five minutes. News is also really good at storytelling because they have to run and gun. They're shooting at five o'clock that fire and they've gotta be on the air by six. So they take shortcuts and both if you watch 60 minutes infomercial and news, you will learn all the tips of storytelling. The lean-in effect. You want to create content where people want more. So one of the reasons the police chases work so well in the big cities is people wait. They want to see what happens at the end. It's the lean-in effect. So you want to create, you know, when you're posting that photo, you got to post it in a series, again, with the episodic. So how many of you have seen this show? Right? Yeah, how, how, how long is the good stuff? Six tissues worth. Six tissues worth? That's the best answer I've had since I've used this example. Right? So th they understand humans because we like drama. It's 55 minutes of drama and five minutes of feel good. Yeah, in our storytelling, we do all feel good and we forget that people are attracted to that drama. 
it's okay. And I know it's, it, it, it's a learning experience and a progression to have an organization allow some of the challenges. I know at the rescue mission, we would start getting some really high engaged social media engagement, a lot more traffic when it was somebody trying to get sober than it was somebody just being put into housing. So don't let those stories scare you. If you can, and, and I'm gonna to try to tie this all together, if you can do episodic stories that help show a journey that both of the victory and the struggle to get there, that is the recipe for storytelling gold. 76% of marketers feel they know what their customers want, yet only 34% have asked their customer. So important, we all, you know, think we know we're marketing to ourselves. Well, I don't like blue, so it's not gonna be blue. Well, people might like blue. And listening. I was landing in the Frankfurt, Germany airport, and I said, I hope they have coffee, and the airport responded to me. Welcome at our airport. Obviously, they're learning English a little more. Um, here are all our coffee locations. So about a couple months back, I was landing in Sweden, and I love this one because they're using GIFs, which drive me crazy because, I don't know, the internet is turning to all that stuff. Um, well, hello there. Uh, one of my favorites is I'm, I'm, I, I'm in a suit and tie and I jumped onto a virgin train. Not sure, but it all may be a dream. And virgin responded, should we pinch you to make sure? And then a friend um, said, as they say, photo or it didn't happen. Suits are sexy. So I said, this is now what I call my Ricky Lake Show suit. And yes, Virgin Trains pinch me. And they responded, just tried to, but you went by too fast. <laughs> so do you remember the exercise on voice? This is perfect, or near perfect. Because Virgin is a little bit of a snarky brand. And Trains, their brand, their, the, is to get there on time, to be the fastest train. So they responded perfectly, or near perfectly. And I did show a picture, and then Ricky Lake shared it out. Um, I used to do this a lot. I don't do it a lot anymore. I know a lot of people, they, they, they search on tags or whatever, but I just searched the word homeless. And you know, you get a lot of people um, uh, that uh, I sometimes I, I fight myself that I, from responding because they get me mad. And I've made great connections with people that I never would have met if I wasn't searching. But this is one of my favorites. So this is a mommy blogger. Now mommy bloggers were a really big thing a couple years ago. They still control trillions of dollars of spending in the United States economy. So they're still a big deal. But this is a mommy blogger in Salt Lake City, and she says, have you ever made a paper plane out of a $5 bill and thrown it out of a car window while passing a homeless guy? Me neither. So I didn't say, you rotten woman. How could you say that? I played with her. I said, please let me know what street you'll be throwing the $5 bill out for the homeless, and I'll make sure I'm there to catch it. And she said, she responded, great. Why on earth would I throw a $5 bill out my window to someone who's not following me in Twitter? So now I send her a link, and now she starts backpedaling. Are you a homeless guy with a wireless laptop, or did you Google those links? It's true, they did help my heart. And then she's going on and on. I said, it's me. I sometimes search the word homeless, and I engage if interesting you were. She went on to create a website called $5 Paper Airplane, where she went out and she folded up a paper airplane, a $5 bill, and handed it to a homeless person and, and did their story on her blog. Now, she hasn't, she's got kids and she hasn't kept it up in years. This is kind of an old example, but it's such a good example of listening and engaging, I, I still use it. So five minutes of time, zero marketing budget, and she's doing my work. And now I'm engaging in her network. And this could work if you're selling pizza or if you're advocating for literacy or whatever your cause is or your business listening and engaging people. And storytelling is two-way. So I'm gonna really quickly, because I wanna do questions and answers, go into a little bit of the future, because I think it's so important where everything's going. Things are changing. There's so many examples that I use, but this is probably one of the best. 
This is the first time in history that mobile has surpassed desktop. Um, in a given day, because people multitask, they have decided that 31 hours and 28 minutes are in a given day. Because I can be on the treadmill and I could be listening to a podcast. So there's 31 hours and 28 minutes. And this is from the Bureau of Labor and Edison Research. And a lot of really smart people figured out that we have 31 hours in a day. I wish I had 31 hours. It still wouldn't be enough time. So here's this attention. And what it is, Gary Vaynerchuk talks a lot about return on attention and attention. What we're fighting for is somebody's attention. And so this is what amount, and if anybody wants, I can send, send you this deck with all this information. There's a lot of great stuff. I only put, picked out a, a few slides. But this is what we're fighting for, is the people's attention, whether they're watching TV, looking at the screen, doing everything else. So time spent on major devices, video is growing. Video is going way past social media, and it's going to continue to grow. So if you don't have a video department, and a video department could as be as your phone, but you're starting to put video into your storytelling, you need to start. So messaging, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, WeChat are the fastest growing. So I don't know if it's going to be five years. I don't know if it's going to be 10 years. But the email and everything else, it's going to be messaging. It's how you're going to be interacting on messaging. It's going to be 1.1 billion users by 2018. So KLM now uses Facebook Messenger for boarding passes, flight info, and customer service. Facebook Messenger, and this is just from this week, now allows payments in its bots. So the, I only think, um, and this may have changed, um, I only think it's the refugee, United Nations refugee, and I think maybe UNICEF, and there's a, uh, that are using messaging right now. Um, there's the Crisis Text Line, which is a brilliant organization, and they're using it to help people. You know, suicide prevention on Facebook Messenger, which is brilliant. Uh, and it's, I'm just saying this needs to be on your radar. This is how people are communicating. Anybody that has kids, know your kids text. You know, they text more than they call. They text more than they email. So the future of your organization is going to be messaging at some form. Um, most customers, this came out yesterday, most customers now want to use messaging to interact with businesses, cross out businesses and put nonprofits or whatever you want. But everybody's on Facebook and everybody's messaging. And there's this whole thing, I mean, if you look at Snapchat, it's what's called the, 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 a private social network that's growing. It's harder to reach people because, you know, for years everybody was warning the kids saying, you don't want to put those photos up on Facebook. So now they jump over to uh, platforms and channels that the content disappears or it's not seen by a lot of people. Um, so, and I will end with the... Uh, virtual reality. So two, three years ago, two years ago, I was at South by Southwest, and virtual reality was still underground. So here I'm walking down a street in Syria, and a bomb blows up in front of me, which is a very powerful experience. And, um, but it's still, you know, my cause is homelessness. Back to the intention doesn't equal love. I thought it was amazing. So this last year, I, was, I spoke at uh, South by Southwest on, on nonprofit uh, video. And um, even McDonald's had uh, an activation of VR. And the agencies are going to tell you, the, the nonprofit agencies are going to say, you need to do virtual reality. You need to. So I asked the room, how many people put on a virtual reality headset? 100% of the people raised their hand. I said, how many do you want to put on another headset? Three people raised their hand, and they're probably gamers. So it's going to change. Samsung already has the patent for it to be in contact lenses. 
So augmented reality and different things is gonna change where you don't have to have the headset. It's changing fast. But just by having re virtual reality, whether it be whatever nonprofit you work for, isn't gonna get me to necessarily convert to be your supporter. I love how Charity Water uses it. They use virtual reality at their banquets. So you know how you always have this um, uh, video on the screen? Well, now you're gonna experience the wells in Africa. I bet you their donations go up because of this, because it's immersive and the people now experience it. So I do support virtual reality, but I don't support it. I mean, I should clarify, it's not that it's supporting or anything. I'm just saying as nonprofits, it's really expensive and you're not gonna get a lot of bang for your buck. If you are gonna do virtual reality now, I mean five years, everything's gonna change. You might wanna look into in-person events. And how many of you think all this drives you crazy? We got one in the back too. It drives me crazy, but I have something for you. It's, it's, a, it's a social network, it's a tool, and it, it's not new, but it really works really well. A table and two chairs. The relationship building, so social media and storytelling, and I don't know, uh, some of you might wear many hats where you're also the, the donor dev people, but a major gift officer just doesn't walk up to a stranger and say, give me all your money. You, you go to lunch, you go everything else, but they expect, oh, I tweet, why didn't people give me money? Because you gotta build a relationship. Social media is building a relationship and going face to face is by far the best way of, of building a relationship. I, I believe you should be on social, but you should be using it in a way where you're saying hello to people and sharing information and engaging and providing worth to them, and then bring them in for an event, and then you know convert to whatever your success and whatever your goals are. So that's it for me. And I came in faster than I thought. <laughs> Any questions? Come on, you guys got to have tons of questions. Um, very good. Um, question, and, and I could spend another two hours answering that one because it's a passion of mine, and especially today. I have, are you guys familiar with Link, New York City Link? They, they converted all the old telephone booths to Wi-Fi hotspots, but they had to pull them all back because of homeless people using them and some other stuff. So everybody, most everybody has a smartphone. The problem with lower and no income people is that is all they have. Well, not the problem, one of the challenges. So we usually have a laptop and we have a desktop. Often low and no income people, that's all they have. And when you do the Metro PCS and the crickets and all that, if you read the fine print, you'll see that you only get a couple of, of, of gigabytes and they go through that in a day. So then they're, they're dependent on your Taco Bells and your McDonald's and your, your free Wi-Fi and different things. So there's a great, um, my favorite story is James. James might even be watching. Um, he was video blogging out of an Apple store. So he's homeless in New York and my Google alert goes off because he's video blogging about me. And he's a homeless guy in an Apple store. So I run down, I take him out to dinner and we talk because so the library only allows 45 minutes. But if he, the Apple store on, on, on 5th is open 24 hours. So if he can blend in, he's there. And the internet is his escape, but I, I realized how limiting that was because he's tethered to that store. So I went and, I, well, I actually raised, thanks to all you guys, I did a quick crowdfunding and we went and bought him a tablet. And now he can you know, access the internet whenever there's Wi-Fi. 
And oh my gosh, he lost it. I don't know, maybe he sold it, maybe it was stolen. Doesn't matter. How do you change your life if you cannot connect to the internet? So I bought him another one. You know what? I've totally bought him three. Now he buys his own. He's in housing. But while he was experiencing homelessness, and we always put these roadblocks in, it is a challenge. There's a, uh, a great study, and, and I'm actually speaking uh, in Boston on this very topic on Tuesday at a big messaging conference. And um, so this is really on my, but there's, in Coachella, Coachella Valley, there the school buses, the school districts have put hot spots on the school buses and they park them overnight in low, low income areas because the kids don't have internet access to do their homework. So they took the school buses, made them into hot spots, parked them around the city and They've increased their graduation rates. They've, I mean, the impact of that is is really been dramatic. So you know, I, I uh, digital inclusion now it's like a sexy term, but d digital inclusion I think is so very important. I know for me, I pay a lot of money to Verizon to be on the same amount in in the UK. I don't know if you guys travel, it's 15 pounds, the equivalent of $20. And it's better. And you have all kinds of homeless people online over across the pond compared to here, as far as being mobile and having access all the time. So, good question, thank you. Uh, you mentioned you have 500 tweets, where you go? And I wonder, what's the strategy there? 500 tweets? Oh, no, so, okay, so, yeah, it's great. So, uh, uh, on Kiwi's uh, nonprofit marketing blog, I just did a guest post that it sp speaks on this. So, I'm a one-man band, and I started using a service called Meet Edgar. So, Meet Edgar allows you to store libraries, and then you schedule them out. So, like your evergreen content, um, sign up for our newsletter, that type of stuff. You can build libraries. Um, for me, it was all these posts. And, and, and it's kind of like repurposing content or rescheduling or reusing. Often I would put up a story and I'd, I wouldn't share it again. Well, you might not have seen it. So what I did is I went in and there's something called click to tweet. It's a little plug-in. So I wrote out on all, the, all of my blog posts, click here, and it will populate on Twitter. Well, now that whole strategy comes September whatever, is I've got to change it. I've got to first go in and figure out how it is. So a quick tip I didn't add, but this is a freebie. I'll give you two freebies, actually. So when something new comes out and there'll be a new tool tomorrow, get your username. Even if you don't use it, and you shouldn't be everywhere. Pick one channel, do it well, then move on to another one. Trying to be everywhere is crazy. But like Snapchat comes out. Go and get your username for yourself and your organization. And then just don't use it. And then if it gets popular and you have a need, now you have your username. Angelina Jolie's on Twitter. She's never tweet. She just doesn't want anybody else to have it. The other one is check your followers. Check your followers. So often re reporters... Uh, media people will be following you. Uh, Twitter has really uh, become very big for journalism. And, but you will also have maybe community stakeholders. Richard Branson started following me. He never said hello. Alyssa Milano never started, follow, started following me. She never said hello. Ricky Lake started following me. She never said hello. But then I engage with them. So when somebody that I want to connect with, then I start saying, hey, good morning. How you doing? Oh, sorry you had a flat tire. I start just like you would making a friend, and that's how I got on the Ricky Lake show and became friends with Ricky Lake. She started following me, and she didn't say anything. So look at your followers every day. You can also make lists. Go ahead. I see a question. I'm wondering about the homeless vets. Okay. And what, what's the thing to do with them? You're interacting with them. With homeless vets, so... Um, our country has done a very good job in the last couple of years of eliminating or reducing homeless veterans. Um, they have what's called a functional zero. 
I don't necessarily agree with this model and principle, but it's basically that our community is now ready to, we have somebody in how, if somebody becomes homeless and they're a veteran, we can fast track them into housing. So it's not that they've ended veterans homelessness, they're able to end veterans homelessness. It's a very good thing. Um, it's interesting and I could go into a lot of the different political reasons, but our president said we're gonna end veterans homeless. What happens? Everybody starts jumping. That's a good thing. It's got to come from the top down, but you end homelessness, all homelessness at a local level, you know, because every community is different. One of the things that I got to tell you, being now a Syracuse resident, is you have a very engaged continuum of care and coalition. I'm, when I have time and I go to the meetings, you have all the stakeholders there. I go to other communities, and there might be one or two or three or four that are there engaged. You have everybody there, and that's very encouraging. So to give you actual numbers, I don't know. I think uh, HUD just released something, 44% uh, reduction in homelessness and all that. So we've done a lot better. <laughs> um, uh, again, we work with um, the Autism Community here, and they are um, isolated a lot of time. Um, so our reach out is two-pronged. It's to try to get people who need us to find us. But we find that we're kind of cannibalizing because those are the people that are donating back whatever they have so that we can keep going. Yeah. So we're trying to break into what you were talking about, people that you know, reach out to people that will help us. And so I, I get that it needs to be engaging with a particular voice, make it personal, um, you know, follow the struggle. What do you do with people who, like there's so many privacy laws, or like, do, you, do you get like homeless people to sign waivers? So no, great question. And I know somebody else uh, learning disability nonprofit. I uh, was talking to people early on. So Mancap, which is a very large nonprofit in the UK, brought me in to uh, train their middle to uh, upper management and also start developing programs with people with learning disabilities and autism and different things. So when you're talking about people that might not understand what bullying is, so what, I don't know where they took it, but when I had left after the consulting arrangement, we were developing to have like monitors so that when you have people on there with developmental disabilities or emotional problems or autism that might not understand that somebody's picking on them, that you would be able to interject. So uh, personally, I don't think there's a whole lot of privacy anymore. I mean, we have HIPAA laws, but there's no HIPAA jail. <laughs> Nobody's gone to HIPAA jail, I don't think. Okay, so you're, you're so here, and it was very tough for me because I really wanted to do a section about ethics, um, and so right now, I, I mean, legally. If you take somebody's picture in public, you can post it. Um, so that, you know that's the issue. Right. Everybody has to develop whatever personal policy it is. So legally, if a parent gives permission under 18, it's good. At the rescue mission, the CEO Alan Thornton wasn't comfortable with that. So we developed our own policy. When I went and researched, like most people in communications, I just want to cut and paste your policy, make a few changes, and have mine. But there was no policy for children and photography that I could find. I mean, there wasn't a lot. I mean, there was some for different Africa. So it, it depends on your organization and where you are and your comfort level is. I personally have, uh, a lot of times in nonprofits, we use need-based imagery. I think that's hurt homeless services. You know, I get it. In fundraising, we're going to, hey, this person needs a meal, you know, so let's use a starving kid. And now we portray homeless as being helpless. So that's not necessarily there. But then, and there's studies now, I've read both ways, where, um, I don't know, uh, non-needs-based imagery has produced better results, needs-based imagery 
whatever. I, I kind of go on the lens of honesty, what's real. You know what I mean? I think we're going to see a transition as the older generations that are very motivated by direct mail and that imagery starts changing. The younger generations, the millennials, by the way, they're not aliens, they're just young. <laughs> so, um, but you got to develop on yourself. You have to, um, uh, I, I, you got to cover yourself, do waivers, everything else. If you're doing, and we could talk about this. I know there's a question over there and there's a question over there. There's no ruling for me. You just turn the lens on and pay it. Well, no, I mean, the, the greatest stories are the ones that people don't want to tell. But how do you get those people to tell those stories? So that's up to, I mean, I, for me, it's rather easy because I was homeless for a long time. And I, there's a huge empathy to me. And, and I would be more than happy to show you and, and share some trips. But um, it's about respect. And just going up and being a friend and just respecting that person. But it's not, if I get to the point, sometimes there's a great story and I'm like, God, please say yes. I, when I catch my that, I stop. You know what I mean? When you're in a nonprofit, and here's another thing. So the stories are on the front line and you guys are all marketers or communications people. I recommend getting on the front lines at least four hours a week, if you, four hours a month if you can because that's where the stories are. The people that are on the front lines aren't going to call you usually. Usually you're in a meeting and they say, wow, we did this great thing. And why didn't you tell me I would have been there with a photographer? You've got to be proactive. I've tried every situation in the world. You just got to be proactive, pick up the phone, email, you got any stories, so. Thank you. I, I, Sure. Sure. Um, and one other thing, you said you, you wanted to share the deck with everyone. Yes? Yeah, not this deck. Not this deck. No, okay. I was willing to share a different deck. A different deck. I can share parts of this deck. Okay. I haven't thought about that. So you come, yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's a technology deck by one of the board members of Yahoo that I grabbed that, that's what I was referring to because there's a lot of great information about humans and how we consume media. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I haven't asked that question. As a when I've worked as a service, but okay, I'm repeating the question. How many people had uh, reading challenges that I encountered? I guess that'd be a brief way to say that. Um, as a service provider, and I gotta state this. So, um, uh, if you look at the demographic of homelessness. 60% of the people in their homelessness get out rather quickly. They're probably the more educated. You know, they, whatever reason, a divorce, illness, job loss, hurricane, fire, they're in the homelessness and they're back out. There's that 40% and it changes this, I'm, I'm painting a big brush, that is there for a while and that's the demographic that I used to work with. So my percentage was, is a little skewed, but having to find somebody um, to be able to, and you guys know this more than me, but so often they're embarrassed, so they don't let you know. They take extra time on that form because they can't read it, and then you have to go in and then you figure it out. Oh my gosh, there's another issue here let me sit and read this to you and get over that. So that happened more often than it should. That's, I, I can't give you hard numbers because again, I was working with more of the chronically homeless demographic, um, so.
create one video over time and then you know post it at the end, or is it just better to do many videos along the way and you're not sure how it's doing? So, exactly. So, and I meant yes to both. So, and, and no, I did. So, logistically, it'd be so hard to be, let's say, and I'm going to do it through the lens of homelessness. Somebody comes in through your door, and you're going to say, oh, stand over here. We're going to take your picture. You're new to us. You know, I'm exaggerating the point. And then who do you follow? And all that. It's logistically crazy and hard. What, in the context of what we do, it's almost like you would have to do staff or volunteers to share the challenging part. You know, gosh, I was trying to help Jim today, but he can't read. I got to now stop and teach him how to read. You know what I mean? In that kind of a process of telling the storytelling of what you're doing, in the, and I'm just using the literacy lens with, mixed in with homelessness. But, you know, in that kind of a context, I think finding somebody through the whole position. Now, there are moments that you might be able to say, gosh, uh, so I have done one before and after, and it was completely by accident. There was a gentleman in Albuquerque, New Mexico that I interviewed, and the city went, well, Donnie, too. Um, sorry, there's two uh, that I've, but it wasn't anything planned. It happened organically. I don't know how you would do that without invading somebody's privacy because we're not a reality TV show. You know what I mean? I think that's where we start going on the other side because there's got to be some kind of balance because your programs people don't want to share the stories. They want the client's privacies. And you want to share the stories because you want you know, to get out the word about what you're doing and raise funds and support. I think that tension is necessary and good. So I used to look at it as, God, those darn programs people won't let us tell stories. But now I think that balance should be there. They should be protecting their clients. And we, as far as communicators, should be advocating for storytelling. Does that make sense? So, Mark, I just wanted to thank you for coming to the for Well, thank you. Yeah, as long as you have coffee. Yeah. Now I recognize you. Yeah, I know I was there. Yeah. Yeah.